Thank you, Robert. We'll be in Psalm 113 in a moment. One of the, uh, an interesting way to get a handle on Scripture or to interpret Scripture is to read a Bible story and ask yourself the question, if I were making a children's story out of this, what's the lesson I would want to teach? If I were going to tell this story as a children's story, what is the lesson I hope children would capture? For instance, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, eating the fruit of the tree that was prohibited by the Lord. What's the lesson? Choices have consequences. Bad choices have a lot of consequences. Or what about that second story in the Bible? What about... Cain and Abel. We're not told many details. Cain offers his sacrifice to the Lord, and it is unacceptable. Abel offers his sacrifice to the Lord, and it is acceptable. And we can speculate that Cain's was a grain offering and Abel's was a blood offering. We don't know. We could speculate and say that Cain had a bad attitude and Abel had a good attitude, but we don't know. But whatever reason, when you get to the end of the story, we are told that the Lord found Abel's sacrifice to be acceptable and he found Cain's to be unacceptable. And Cain became angry and he killed Abel. Now, Abel was doing what was right in front of the Lord and he died. Complicate matters further population at this time is pretty low, you remember. The one who's alive is the one who does not offer worthy worship. The one who is dead is the one who offered worthy worship. God has punished himself in the death of Cain. So what is the lesson that we should be trying to teach children from the story of Cain and Abel? Well, I was in a Bible study one time where the lesson was being discussed between Cain and Abel, and the point was, life is not fair. Some goldfish are in a bowl, and some goldfish are in a bag. Life is not fair, and the sooner you learn that lesson, Bill Gates tells us, the better off you'll be, which is a good lesson coming from the second richest man in the world. Life is not fair. We try to teach that to our children when they're young. We say, honey, there are only eight cheerleaders. Maybe next year, life is not fair. You say, honey, there can only be one quarterback. And Max is six foot five. He's fast. He's smart. He has a strong arm. And honey, you're short. You're slow. You don't have a good arm. There can only be one quarterback, and it's going to be Max. Honey, life is not fair. Every one of you have had those conversations with your children or with somebody else, and you've had them with yourself. They didn't choose you, they didn't pick you, you weren't the right fit. Life is not fair. It's just one of the lessons that we try to teach our children and we try to learn to live with over time. But the trouble is that lesson doesn't offer much hope. Life is not fair doesn't provide any comfort that someday things will be fair. Life is not fair does not provide any hope that things will get better. Life is not fair doesn't produce any of the ideas that we can hold on to and say, yes, someday everything will be made right. Life is not fair is one of those things, it's kind of a fatalistic, we just accept things the way they are and then we move on. In 1937, when she was 25 years old, Ingeborg Rappaport, finished her Ph.D. dissertation on diphtheria at Hamburg University in Germany. Ham- diphtheria was killing, is a bacterial infection that was killing thousands of people around the globe in the 30s. She finished her dissertation that had groundbreaking implications and then was told by her advisor, 
you're not going to be able to stand for your orals and you cannot finish the degree. She argued with them. No explanation. Life is not fair. It's just the way it is. Turn now to Psalm 113. And let's see if we can't move past a little bit of life's fatalism that life is not fair. Verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time on and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens, who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. Reading these first six verses of Psalm 113, he can, the psalmist extols us to call upon the name of the Lord and to praise his name. And that sounds odd to you and I. To praise a name, to praise a label doesn't make sense. It's the person, it's the deity we are to praise in our minds. We want to look past the name of the Lord. We want to look past the name of the God and praise the person behind the name. But it is the name of the Lord that captures all that God is. And he says, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And he lifts high the name of the Lord. And he lifts high the creative works of the Lord. And he says, to, he says about the Lord, the Lord is above the heavens. And he looks down on the heavens. And he looks down past the heavens and to the earth. The Lord, his name is to be praised. He is high. He is glorious. He is creator. He is over all. And the psalmist says, you are to praise his name and he will be Lord over everything. And when you read those first six verses, you see holiness, you see eternity, you see power, you see his creative, creative force, you see God's sense of eternity and being above all. But he seems in these first six verses to be rather distant. You get the idea that God maybe created things. He was a bit, he wound it up like a clock and then he just stepped back and he lets it go. We are to praise his name for his creative activity. We are to praise his name for his holiness. We are to praise his name for his splendor above everything. But you don't see in this first six verses, you don't see a lot of interaction between this God who is over all and earth. It is deism. Deism is the theology that was professed by most of our American forefathers. George Washington was a deist. George Washington believed that there was a God who created the universe and that God was involved in the universe, but he wasn't involved in the, the nitty-gritty day-to-day things. He kind of wound things up and he lets them go and even though George Washington had a wonderful prayer life and was involved with the God of creation, he didn't see and, be, and understand about God being involved in the nitty-gritty day-to-day stuff. That's deism. And whether or not you and I want to believe it or confess it, we adhere to that quite a bit in our lives. Life is not fair. It's just the way it is. Some people get sick. Some people die. Some people get chosen. Some people don't. Some people suffer. Some people prosper. Life's not fair. I told you this week, I told you in my newsletter this week about longtime friends of our family the McComb family. I've known Jonathan's aunt for many, many years through Baptist work. Met Jonathan about two years ago. It was Jonathan's family who was in the house that rode down the river last Saturday night. They were in that house on cell phones calling 911 and calling family members as they rode that torrent of water. 
somehow or another, Jonathan made it out. He was 10 miles from where he started when the house broke apart. They think he covered that 10 miles in 15 minutes. He has a broken sternum. He had collapsed lungs and all of his ribs on both sides were broken. He got out of the hospital Thursday night and he's back now in Wimberley. His son has been found. His wife may have been found. His three-year-old daughter has not been found. Life's not fair. Friday's Austin American statesman, beside the update on this family situation and the recovery of the other bodies, was the story of Lake Travis that is now 69% full and people are buying boats again. Yay. Tragedy and commerce side by side. Life's not fair. That's the only answer we have for these circumstances is to say that sometimes life is not fair. Some people get sick and some people remain healthy and you can't figure out why. The plane crash in Plainview Friday night was my stepdad's nephew, a meticulously careful pilot who for whatever reason decided the wedding in San Antonio on Saturday needed to be attended and they needed to leave and the wind threw that plane back to the ground. And his daughter, Michelle, graduated at 7 o'clock and the plane hit the ground at 9 o'clock. Life's not fair. Life's not fair. And yet the psalmist offers us this picture, this picture of a God who has created all and he is over all and he's looking down from above the heavens, through the heavens, and down into the earth. But he doesn't stop there and leave us with just a God who's unattached. He says in the seventh verse, He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and with princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. This holy God comes down from his place of celestial glory. He reaches down and pulls the poor up from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. The God of creation who created it all, who looks down through it all, comes down to us and he sees us in the ash heap, in the suffering of this world, and he lifts us up. And he says he brings brings the barren woman joy. See, that's the promise of the gospel is that God didn't just wind us up like a clock, but instead he has created all things and he has interceded into our world to bring redemption and to correct that which is wrong. And you remember when John the Baptist was in prison? He's depressed, he's downhearted, he's not sure Jesus is the Messiah. And he sends word to his disciples. He says, go and ask Jesus if he's the one or if we need to be looking for someone else. After all, John the Baptist had come preaching that hellfire and damnation message. You better repent of your sins today and be baptized for the repentance and the remission of your sins. He called people out. He named their sins. He called them into the river. Jesus comes along and he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But then he tells these stories about these shepherds who go looking for lost sheep and he tells stories about a woman who's lost a coin and she goes and she sweeps until she finds it and he doesn't tell these stories about people need to get right. He tells people about being found and being joy coming to their lives. And Jesus said to him, you go tell John what you see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk and the lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear and the dead are raised and the poor have the good news brought to them. 
And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. The God of all creation reached down past the heavens and to the earth and gave us his son to put things right, to put things clear, to make what was unfair redemptive. I told you about Ingeborg Rappaport. She's 102 years old now. Her dissertation that was not allowed to be graded in 1937 was 77 years ago. She's 102, and she lives in Massachusetts. Her son is a medical doctor and teaches at Harvard Medical School. You see, when she couldn't, when they refused her dissertation, she left Germany in 1937 in a huff, and she came into the United States of America, and she applied at 48 medical schools. One of them accepted her. She graduated from medical school as a pediatrician, and she began practicing in Cincinnati, Ohio, as a medical doctor. She and her Austrian-born, Austrian-Jewish-born husband had two sons. Last year, Tom was invited to go speak at the University of Hamburg in Germany on a medical seminar. And he said to the dean, let me tell you my mom's story. He said, my mom finished a PhD dissertation in 1937 on diphtheria here at this university, and she was never allowed to stand for her orals. And the dean said, let me look into that. Sure enough, they found a copy in the library, ungraded, no markings. The dean couldn't let it go. He petitioned the PhD committee at Hamburg, Germany, and he called Ingeborg at 102 years of age and said, would you like to stand in defense of your dissertation? He said, now you'll need to get current on the research since 1937. She can't read anymore. She's almost blind. She can't read the computer. So she hired research assistants at Harvard University who did the research and then told it back to her. They prepared her paper. Last February, she flew to Hamburg, Germany. She sat before the committee for 45 minutes. She answered all of their questions. And next Saturday, they're going to put the doctor's hood, Ph.D., on her shoulders, 102 years old. In 1937, it wasn't fair. But through the scrolling of time, and I would think the providence and the weaving of God through history, he reached down, picks up the poor, has them sit on the seats with princes and he brings joy to the barren woman. The God who created it all knows every detail of our lives and he reaches down for us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for a psalm that reminds us that you are Lord of all, creator of all, sustainer of all, knower of all. And yet you reach down and you pick up the poor and you bring joy to the joyless. Father, I ask that you speak the words of this psalm into the hearts of those who are with us today and those who are watching on television. May they know in the circumstances of their life what may not be fair today will be made right by your hands. Father, I ask that you speak these words of truth and comfort and build us up and give us strength. Lord, may our hearts hear these words. 
And may in this time of commitment we renew our hope in life circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation today is Shine on Us. We invite you to come today accepting Christ as Savior, coming to join in the fellowship of our church. If you have a need you'd like to pray about this morning, you come, I'll be here. Let's stand, let's sing, and let's respond to the Spirit in this time of commitment.